Today on Rock the Park, we're exploring a place teeming with sea creatures. This is something that we've never seen before. No. Forest animals. Bears could be anywhere. Hello. Hey, bear. And ice. Oh, wow. wow. More than a 1,000 square miles of it. This is Kenai Fjords National Park. The ice is literally eating that mountain over there. And it all starts right now. I'm Jack Stewart. This is the real deal. And I'm Colton Smith. These are mountains! We've been buddies for years. Always in search of the next adventure. Dude, what was that? We share a passion for our national parks and other wild places around Ooh. the world. Oh my god. Man. Heading off the beaten path. Pushing our Ooh. limits. Ooh. And experiencing nature's best kept secrets. Here we go! Ah. It's how we Rock the park. No matter how many national parks we visit, we never reach the end of our bucket list. I've been wanting to come here for an incredibly long time, and I'm, I'm so excited right now. Kenai Fjords National Park is Alaska's smallest, but still makes up about 1,000 square miles on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula. More than half is covered in ice. There are 40 glaciers here, still carving out the fjords that give the park its name. It's a process that began about 30,000 years ago when a vast sheet of ice moved down the mountains, gouging deep valleys that filled with water as the ice melted. All right, everybody, we are in Seward, Alaska. That's Seward, not Steward, like my last name. This is going to be an awesome trip. We're starting it off by doing a little sightseeing. We're going to get on a boat, check out some wildlife. Tomorrow, we'll be on Kenai's one and only hiking trail into the Harding Ice Field, where the glaciers originate. So this place has got everything. You've got incredible mountains, enormous glaciers going right into the water, and then just an abundance of wildlife. So much wildlife, we're already seeing it. We're not even on the cruise yet, and we got an otter right out here by the dock. Man, those things are cool, and they're massive. I mean, these sea otters are enormous. Look at the size of that guy. Sea otters can grow five feet long, and they like shallow coastal water like this, where it's easy to dive for shellfish and sea urchins. That's a good sign. We're heading out into Resurrection Bay. One of the things that I love about our national parks is the scenery is just always so epic. I mean, look at this. It's like you're just drifting through some sort of like mythical landscape. We've got the fog. We've got all these different islands. It's just beautiful. We're looking for whales, and we don't have to wait long, because after 20 to 30 minutes, they have to come up to breathe. You're just scanning, and you see nothing, and then all of a sudden, they pop out. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. It's right up against the rock. OK. Yeah. Wow. I saw a spout. Oh, yeah, you see that? Oh, wow. Got her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. We got two, two whales. This is awesome. So what type of whale? They're fin whales. And it seems like we've got a mother, and we also have a calf, too. They're nicknamed the Greyhound of the Sea because they're sleek and fast, moving at speeds up to nearly 30 miles per hour. They're actually the second largest whale. These things can get up to 90 feet long. It's one big mammal. 90 feet is the distance between bases in Major League Baseball. It's amazing that such gigantic animals live on small fish and tiny sea creatures like krill, eating tons of them every day. So these fin whales are actually filter feeders. They don't use teeth to grind up food. What they actually do is they bring in tons of water that has food inside of it. We've got this baleen, which is the same kind of material as our fingernails. It strains the water out just like that. And then they've got all that food. And then there's wildlife that makes itself at home on land and water. Got three puffins up there on the cliffside. I don't know why they remind me of penguins. Like penguins, puffins are built for diving under the water to catch and eat fish. 
Unlike penguins, they can actually fly if they have to. Got some sea lions right up on that rock right there. These are stellar sea lions. Kenai Fjords has plenty of spots where they can haul themselves out of the water and relax in the sun. They look like they're big, large, lazy creatures, but in fact, they're actually really agile hunters. They dive down and they gather as much fish as they possibly can. And because of their hunting skills, these males can get up to about 2,400 pounds. Oh my gosh, oh, oh, I see something. Straight out here. Right there, right there. Oh man. Wow, yep, saw Wow. We've got orcas, orca whales. This is a full grown male with a dorsal fin almost six feet high. Oh, I see him, I see another one in the distance there. We've come up to a pod of orca whales. This is something that we've never seen before. No, I've never seen an orca. Orcas are one of the largest predators in the sea, second only to the sperm whale. They're called killer whales because they can take down larger marine animals like sea lions and sharks. So orcas are actually a member of the dolphin family, believe it or not. They can get anywhere from like 23 to 26 feet long and almost 16,000 pounds. A pod is a group of orcas that sticks together to raise their young and hunt as a team, like a wolf pack. And that pod is led by the oldest and normally the largest female orca. The males will stay with that matriarch their entire lives. She knows the lay of the land, and she basically just drives the pod to wherever the best feeding opportunity is. The adults are keeping their distance, but this young bull is coming in for a closer look at us. Wow. Wow. He's yeah. so close to us right now. Whoa! Wow, look at him. Look at him down there. That was insane. Whoa. He breached right in front of us, literally right down there, and I saw him just swim underneath the boat. That was incredible. That was incredible. Our day at sea isn't over yet, and neither are our close encounters. Wow, sick. That was cool. We're in Alaska exploring Kenai Fjords National Park, a spectacular landscape formed by moving ice like the Holgate Glacier. Oh man, that thing is massive. Wow, it's three miles long. That's insane. Holgate is a tidewater glacier. That means it starts higher up in the mountain and flows down to the ocean. So a fjord is basically a glacially carved body of water. So over time, these glaciers have sculpted these valleys. We're speaking softly here because everyone is listening as well as looking for falling ice. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Wow. Sick. That was cool. Calving is when a moving wall of ice meets the water and chunks start breaking off into the sea. Oh, wow. Wow. Sounds like fireworks. Man. So cool. Now, because light travels faster than sound, we actually see this thing calve before we hear it. So you can see the chunks of ice fall off, and then you start to hear the massive roar, which is kind of cool. You get both experiences separate from each other. Holgate is one of more than 30 glaciers originating from the biggest ice field in America, the Harding Ice Field. That's where we're headed tomorrow. But for now, one last reminder that there is lots more wildlife to see in this park. Straight up here, straight up off of the front of the boat. Got a black bear right up there. Black bears are one of the most widespread animals in Alaska. They can get as big as six feet long and weigh up to 600 pounds. I've been incredibly wrapped up today in what's been going on in the water. That is a great reminder for us tomorrow. We are in bear country. We've got black bears, brown bears, and they are everywhere. Early the next morning, the sun is already high in the sky because it never really sets during midsummer in Alaska. We are headed up to the uh, Harding Ice Field, which is gonna be a really, really awesome hike. We've got some serious elevation, about 3,500 feet straight up over four miles. 
It's gonna be grueling, but the reward is gonna be worth every ounce of effort. Got my bear spray, Grizzly Tough. Good, okay. Accessible, always needs to be accessible. The bear is not gonna stand for you saying, hey, hold up a sec, let me get it out of my pack. It's a short walk to the trailhead and the only hiking trail in Kenai Fjords. It's a little over eight miles round trip to the Harding Ice Field. Looks like this is where the uphill really begins. Hey, bear. Yee -yee. It's pretty. So we've been told that a mother black bear with her three cubs has been frequenting this dense area at the beginning of the trail. So we're gonna be making much more noise than we normally do. And hopefully we don't spook her or stumble upon her in any way. Mother grizzly bears will attack humans if they believe their cubs are threatened. Black bears are more likely to hustle their cubs up the nearest tree. But in the wild, it's always a good idea to be extra cautious around mothers and their young. Hey, bear. You. Look how dense this is. I mean, if you look around, we are just absolutely tunneled in by all this vegetation. Bears could be anywhere. We can't see them, and more importantly, they can't see us. So really, all we have are our voices. Hello. Hey, bear. We're back, bear. It's just us. Immersing ourselves in nature and just taking a deep breath of fresh air surrounded by trees and mountains is one of the healthiest things you can do. It boosts the immune system, reduces stress, increases your ability to focus, and frankly, will make you feel great. One of the reasons that I love coming out into nature is, is how connected I feel to this earth and to everything around me. To me, nature is a picture for how I want to live my life. Balance, harmony with other human beings, harmony with the environment. But when it really comes down to it, we're a part of, a, of something that is remarkable. Finally, after two miles, we get our first glimpse of the receding exit glacier. That's incredible. And it's just a hint of what's to come. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like this. Oh. Look at that. Wow. Oh, my gosh. We're in Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, where we've been hiking for a couple of hours, hoping to reach the giant Harding Ice Field, which spawns dozens of glaciers. Oh, yeah. Wow. Breaking out a tree line. At last, we can see one of those glaciers, the Exit Glacier, spread out below us. Oh, yeah. That is one massive chunk of ice. It's enormous. Exit Glacier got its name when the first group of people to cross the Harding Ice Field used this as their exit point in 1968. It's always amazing to me how you can see the grooves in the glacier as it curves through the valley, carving it out. And all those grooves, a lot of them are crevasses that go deep. I mean, really deep. It's what makes traveling on a glacier very dangerous. This is an alpine glacier formed over thousands of years by the accumulation of unmelted snow high in the mountains. Exit Glacier reached its peak size in the early 1800s and has been shrinking ever since. So there is snowfall, but even in the wintertime, there are some days where the temperatures aren't even hitting freezing. And that's why glaciers like Exit Glacier have receded so much quicker than expected over time. We still haven't laid eyes on the Harding Ice Field, and to get near it, we're hiking above the tree line in what's called the Alpine Zone. Get up here. I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like this. Yeah? Whoa. Now that is an ice field, man. Look at that. Holy cow. We officially have eyes on the Harding Ice Field. I've never seen this big of an expanse. I mean, the ice is literally eating that mountain over there. Yeah. 
I mean, and this is just a sliver. We're seeing a tiny portion of what this ice field actually entails. The Harding Ice Field 700 square miles is a remnant of an ice sheet that covered half of Alaska during the Ice Age, 23,000 years ago. We've climbed thousands of feet already from the valley floor, so that gives you an idea of how deep this ice goes. I mean, that is thousands and thousands of feet of compressed ice altogether. The pressure of that compressed ice pushes more than 30 glaciers out through the surrounding mountains. It's so interesting to see how the glacier peels off of the ice field. It's much smoother, I bet there's tons of snowpack, and then it just starts to fraction off, and you get to see those grooves that work their way down this valley. The most spectacular view of the ice field is still ahead at the summit of the trail. To get there, though, we need to hike across snow and ice and a potential hazard. So we are in a section of this trail that has uh, had some pretty recent rockfall. So we're making sure to uh, move through this without stopping. And so even in the middle of summer, there are still things that are falling from the top here that we have to keep our eyes peeled for. And that's not all. So what we've got here is some fur from a mountain goat. Um, in the summertime, they shed their thick winter coats. And a lot of times you'll see these guys walking around up here with just like tufts of fur hanging off of them. It looks kind of gnarly sometimes. A very interesting thing about the mountain goat, it's not a goat at all. Mountain goats are actually part of the antelope family. Humans often name animals based on what they look like rather than their biology. Mountain goats live in higher elevations and have split hooves better suited for climbing, but it's their two horns that separate them genetically from true goats. Mountain goat horns are shorter, pointier, and more slender. We're on the final stretch of this hike, but the trail hasn't run out of surprises. Wow. We're hiking a ridge in Alaska's Kenai Fjords National Park when we stumble onto this. Wow. At first, it looks like maybe some predator has been dragging its prey across the snow, but it's actually something completely different. So this is called watermelon snow. And believe it or not, it's an algae that grows on top of the snowpack in the summertime up in alpine regions like this. It's this bright, bright red, almost a pink color that really, really stands out amidst just these blankets of white. At last, we spot a shelter built for hikers who get caught in a sudden snowstorm. A little beyond it is the lookout point we've hiked just over four miles to reach. Now that is a view. My gosh. My brain can't even like comprehend distance up here. That's incredible. I mean, we can't even see the end of it. You can see just way off in the distance, more mountain peaks just completely covered and swallowed up by ice, and then it just keeps going and going. At 700 square miles, Harding is the largest fully contained ice field in the United States. And if you count the glaciers that descend from it, we're looking at over 1,100 square miles of ice. All right, we made it to the top. Good job. Well done. And well worth it. Man, what a diverse park. I mean, think about all the different landscapes that we've seen just on this two-day trip. The water, the mountains, the islands, the fjords, the glaciers, the Harding Ice Field, lush vegetation, so much wildlife. I mean, seeing an orca in the wild for the first time. Oh. And not just seeing one, seeing it about 10 feet away. Whoa. And then today, to immerse ourselves in just a completely different landscape. That's incredible. An end at a place that I literally have been dreaming about for the last six years. I mean, it just shows how fortunate we are. I mean, this is one of those destinations that people just dream of coming to. This is a bucket list place. Seriously. Finally. Alaska is a land of true extremes, and no matter how many times we visit, there's always more to see. And remember, if we can do it, so can you. So the next chance you get, go out and rock the park.
I'm the king of the world! You can't beat being on a boat. You just can't. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Make sure to leave any questions or comments that you have. And please, subscribe to the channel. There's a lot more to come.